Mayflower white, Mayflower green, in the sea's crystal, what have you seen? Mayflower two? Mayflower one, when was your pilgrim story begun? Today in England, there still remain places and buildings associated with the Pilgrim Fathers before they sailed for America more than 300 years ago. I, William Brewster, of suit Russet Brown, sailed 1620 from Southampton Town. Postmaster, scholar, indifferent sailor, trusting in God and a three-masted whaler. This is our monument. This was the hour taking a trip in a 90-foot flower. The pilgrims originally lived in the North Midlands, and they became pilgrims because their religious ideas offended the government. This is the house where King James' fists shut about the separatists, sent us away, for God wouldn't be concealed at Scrooby Manor and Austerfield, sent Mr. Brewster to a double Dutch land, and William Bradford is second in command. After selling all they possessed, the pilgrims attempted to escape to Holland. But as they were about to embark, they were captured by the local militia and taken to Boston in Lincolnshire, where they were tried at the Guildhall. But as we embarked on a pierhead jump, we were robbed and rifled off Boston stump. Searched our shirts and shaken our stays, we were jugged in the jail for 31 days trapped as an oyster, cold as a clam, dreaming of freedom and Amsterdam. But at last, in 1608, they reached Holland. After a dozen years there, about 50 pilgrims sailed in the Speedwell, joined the Mayflower at Southampton, and together left for the New World. But the Speedwell sprang a leak, and both ships returned to Plymouth. Plymouth and its Barbican. The Barbican that is also known, Sir John Hawkins, Drake, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, Raleigh. The Barbican, where the pilgrims abandoned their first ship, the Speedwell, and finally sailed in the Mayflower on September the 6th, 1620. The ship manned by a crew of 21. Now there were 102 pilgrims, 50 men, 20 women, 32 children. 335 years later, on the 4th of July, 1955, the building began of Mayflower II. The work has been financed by a non-profit making company. The ship's designer is William Baker, naval architect to the American Bethlehem Steel Corporation. And its builder is a Devonshireman, Stuart Upham, whose family and firm have been building wooden vessels for 150 years. The hills of South Devon are well clothed with woodland, and the sea, running inland up curving estuaries, is always close at hand. So Mayflower too began in the Devonshire countryside. It began, as Stuart Upham once said, by looking for the heart of England's prosperity, an acorn. In this case, a Devon oak. And the lumbermen set their axes to the first of six to seven hundred trees of all shapes and sizes. The main beam of Mayflower measures only 55 cubic feet, but it was shaved down from a solid oak trunk of over twice that size. Timbers of every proportion are needed for the bones and body of the boat, straight for the beams and planking, crooked for the ribs and knees. All the timber for the ship must, of course, be properly seasoned. And the timber yard is the place where the builder must choose his trees. And surely, steadily, the oak tree is press-ganged into service. First, a journey of seven or eight miles under a cider and scrumpy yellow sun. The ship's timbers have come to town. Brixham towns in Devon, by the wobbly, wash-blue sea, where the streets are as narrow as a toad in a harrow, and there's crab and cream for tea. Where the mackerel, bass and the pollock parade on the edge of the quay, and Francis Light took a notion to write the words of Abide With Me. 
where the lion and bear left their bones in a lair on the bullock red Brixham sand. And William III jumped out of the sea with an orange in his hand. Here in the shipyard is the first stage in building, laying the keel, 14 inches by 12, 58 feet long. The great lumps of timber joined by a keel scarf. Stuart Upham, the builder, called the keel a ruddy great log. But the general foreman, George Phillips, he called it a fine stick. In the mold loft over the shipyard, the lines of the hull are drawn in schoolboy chalk and to working size on the wooden floor. Drawing the ship's frame life-size has its own problems. For the Mayflower, too, is bigger than the loft, so the hull has been halved. That's why the chalk lines cross each other like crazy railway lines. These are set with pine stripping that, carefully based on the architect's blueprint, gives a sequence of cross-sections of the hull, and the curves of her body grow. All timbers of the original Mayflower were cut by hand, by pit saw, adz or axe. Today, the only genuinely modern pieces of machinery that can be used in building this replica of a wooden whaler are the electric drills and saws. Machinery can't supplant the skill of the head Zoya. He is still one of the most important people in the shipyard. But the principal tool in the shipwright's chest is the ads. And this was employed on Mayflower too, together with a score of others that have been used, with simple variations, since the days when Noah was a sailor. A shipwright lay a-dying, all flickering were his lamps. He cried to his wife, If you'll save my life, bring out my forelock clamps. Bring my augers, bring my adz, bring my old chop bevel, bring my trenel, bittle and spike, or I'll dry dock at the devil. Bring to me my round-bottom plane, and bring the double-making. Go rub with wax my shiny axe, or a damned long trip I'll be taking. Throw all your medicines in the sea and bring my gimlet true. If the doctor can't heal my stem and keel, we'll see what a shipwright can do. Slowly, the skeleton of the ship takes shape. Its bones like a stranded dinosaur, made of huge chunks of solid oak, the crooked timbers carefully matched, one tree to one piece, some weighing originally anything up to ten tons. The skin of the ship is the planking, long lengths of copse-grown timber clamped to the ribs two and a half inches thick, shaped again by the ads. The planks for the end pieces have to be bent to shape, curved in a steam kiln, a sweat box three foot square, and hauled out with calipers.
eight strong men on the steaming stem making the Mayflower skin to keep the tide and the fish outside and the passengers safe within. They make her chest, they make her breast, they make her chin and her cheek. For a ship of her line, like a glass of wine, should never spring a leak. Oh, make her firm and give her a perm, sings out the saucy sea. In a suit of lath from her Turkish bath, she's just a girl for me. Over a quarter of a million visitors from all over the world came to see Mayflower II during the 22 months of her building. Here's a group of naval cadets from the continent. Their guide is Alan Villiers himself, Australian man of the sea, author, commander of Mayflower II and her 1957 crew. The sailmakers stab away, five stitches to the inch, at the ship's two suits of fine flax canvas. No wonder Villiers exploded one day at his newspaper critics. Tow her over? No, sir, not on your life. She'll sail. But before she took to the water, the preparations for launching, a steady, skiffle group of shipwrights worked to the cry of the shantyman. That evening, after the shipwrights had all returned to their firesides, the builder and the designer walked the deck and talked of the next day's launching. Two men whose industry and skill had turned Devon Oaks into sweeping lines. Searching back through early drawings and documents, they had worked out not only the shape the original Mayflower must have been, but also how the ancient mechanism of her rigging must have harnessed the power of the wind. Glorious Devon, says the unkind ride. Rain six days out of seven. And there were certainly six days rain in one on launching day. Not that it bothered Mr. Rice Lemming of Toppenish, Washington, USA, the man chosen to launch Mayflower II, sometime U.S. airman who saved 22 lives in the East Coast floods of 1953 and was awarded the George Medal by the Queen of England. The moment in time... 22nd of September 1956 at 8 in the morning to catch the tide. The drafts of claret came from a silver gilt christening cup and it was shared with all the shipwrights. Finally, the goblet was flung into the sea. That was the way they did it in the old days. Below, 20 men loosened the ship from her keel blocks. The final blow... She's away. The man who watched closest was the master builder himself, attentive as a midwife, and after a successful delivery, as equally relieved. I saw you strike your first storm, Mayflower, fly on the sea like a feather, and blown by a prayer your first salt water wear in the thunder and lightning weather. Do you remember your launching, Acorn, as on the white sea you were sown? When it seemed that your hope, without rigging or rope, was to waltz the Atlantic alone. A lot of us watching felt that, and it seemed a pity that she had to go right into dry dock to have her superstructure built. So the ship begins her fitting out. Another deck has been added, the main deck, which one day will be pounded by the waves of the Atlantic. So with corking iron and corking mallet, they stop the seams with oakum and pay them up with pitch.
Meanwhile, the lathe revolves, a giant windlass that turns and shapes the capstan. turns and time moves on, moves on towards the hour when Mayflower must sail away to America. Parts and materials arrive from all over the kingdom and from the Commonwealth too. The spars arrive square cut from a distant sawmill. They will be worked upon by the men who wield the adze so skillfully, acquiring gently tapering forms. The foremast is an 80-footer of Oregon pine, shipped, like all Mayflower II's masts and spars, from Canada to the port of Manchester, brought by rail to Torquay because the streets of Brixham were too twisting and narrow, and then floated across Torbay to the shipyard. This is the end of their first Atlantic journey. Soon, they'll make another in the opposite direction. Did nobler trees grow in England three centuries ago? Pines which lived long enough to make high masts for tall ships? Probably not. For the rope bands we see in old drawings set round the masts of vessels of this period tell us that their shipwrights had to build up the bigger spars of lesser timbers bound together. A mast of this size is stepped with great delicacy. One accident and it would lunge down like a monstrous dart and pierce a splintering hole in the ship waiting to receive it. But there are no mistakes. The riggers are careful men of wide experience. Three of them own sailing master's tickets, but with no more sailing ships to command, they have come ashore forever and now punch their time cards at the shipyard. Oh, three masts has our sturdy ship. Three masts will she wear when she, like Christ our Saviour, walks on the watery stair. One stands at the fore to meet the weather wild and he who once in winter was a little child. One grows after from step to the sky for he who once was keel-hauled and hung up to die. One stands amidships between fore and mizzen pointing to paradise for he who is risen. Three masts will grow on the gallant ship before she quits the quay. For Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, blessed Trinity. With her foremast stepped, the ship is supplied with the true source of her strength, from which her muscles of rope and canvas will grow to guide her through the water. And all this progress is watched, not only by the builder, but also by his father, who once ran the yard before him, but who has now retired. Once she was rough and the colour snuff, and her skin was dry as a shaving. Her sticks were the sheen of margarine, and not a whipcord was she waving. No coat did she wear on the wandering air, and she sent her boyfriends raving. But now she is green and nectarine, white as a Whitsun lily. Her frame is fed with oil and lead, and she smells like the Isles of Scilly. And the rubbing strake, her color shake, like a Jezebel fairground filly. Once the main spars were placed in position, work went ahead on the rigging. Twelve tons and twelve miles of it, divided into over 400 different items. It all had to be ordered a year ahead, with exact descriptions of gauge, length and braking strains. The contract was completed by a Scottish firm, 
and after the rope arrived at Brixham, the riggers sorted out each piece and gradually built up the complicated pattern of cordage. Said the builder to the captain as they gathered at the gaunt seaside, my buxom Brixham baby I bring you for your bride. A hundred daughters, captain, I've settled on the sea, but this one is the fairest of all our family tree. So don't be nervous, Captain, as you ring her marriage bell, for from her hundred sisters, she's learnt her lesson well. Treat her tough and tender as you honeymoon on the blue, and don't wink your eye when you say goodbye, for I am coming too. Will you walk among my rigging, said the Mayflower to Mayfly, and solve a simple crossword puzzle scribbled in the sky? You may coast my cabled mainstay like a pellet from a gun. You may slide from beak and bowsprit up the mizzen to the sun. For never, never, never has such a yarn been spun. Said the Mayflower to the Mayfly as she took the twisting tide. My muscles of milk are sweet as silk and corded on the Clyde. So hail the mangle wurzel and hail the cocoa tree and hail all holy vegetables from Tongking to Torquay. And hail the humble hempen plant that drives me through the sea. At the end of March, the main yard was ready for hoisting, with the mainsail bent on and lashed tight. Now the Mayflower was almost ready to be refloated. There was ballast in her hold, but not the full quantity, otherwise she wouldn't get out of the dock, even on high tide, due on April the 1st. She was, as seamen say, a bit tender. As I woke up one evening and smelt the April air, the water wrote its warning all up my seaweed stair. Take care, my chuck, my chicken, and save your heart in store. Don't let its thumb beat quicken for the mermaid girl next door. Keep your temperature normal as you walk all round the town. Your behavior must be formal or you'll clue up upside down. But I opened wide my window, I opened my heart and my door, and my liver like love blew stormy, and I fell down on the floor. I rocked, I rolled, I rumbered, I saw King Neptune stare, and with his triple-tongued trident reach up to comb my hair. Oh, tug me to safe water, and let me lie at my ease, where I won't roam like a metronome with a list of twelve degrees. So, boys, if for love you're ready, and your heart is under way, keep your ballast steady for it's April Fool's Day. With a belly full of ballast and crew complete, the ship was ready for her sailing trials. For days, the captain, mates, and able seamen had been familiarizing themselves with the working of the rigging. Now, the last carpenter had swept up the last chipping, the compass had been swung, Stores were aboard, and the moment had come for the first time to head for the open sea. Sitting in Brixham Harbour, she gave her admirers a glimpse of former centuries. Not for 300 years had the red rocks of Devon seen such a sight. Not since the English fleet sailed from this coast to drive the Armada up channel. Nor since those merchantmen journeyed cautiously yet fearlessly about a question mark called the map of the world. There she sat, while the local hotels filled themselves with landlubber pressmen, waiting with pens and shutters poised to capture the first drop of her sails. Then one evening, the tug Penley took the tow rope aboard, and Mayflower turned away from Brixham Quay, away from Upham's Yard, and away from the craftsmen who built her. Farewell to thee, Mayflower said Brixham with a hoot and a bang. You've been a credit to us in more ways than one. You've shown the world what our boat builders can do, and you seem to bring half the world to Brixham to watch them doing it. It was a perfect evening. Clear skies and a light breeze. Up went the colors. Out she went past the breakwater with an attending fleet of smaller vessels away from the confines of the harbour to the open sea.
once clear of the land, this sailing ship could become her real self for the first time. She could let her heavy canvas fall from her yard arms and see what the wind would do with it. One by one, the sails unfurled, ponderously like elephant skin, in a breeze which was kind and gentle to the newcomer. And I heard him ask, what's it all about? Why spend thousands on building a ship that's hundreds of years out of date and can't even sail out of its own harbor because the wind's in the wrong direction? An admiral shook his head and mumbled that she'd be lucky if she ever got to the other side. Crazy fools, they say. There ought to be a law against it. Not long ago, Mayflower II was no more than an idea. Now she is a fact and a thing of beauty. But behind the fact, there remains an idea. A hope that she will be accepted the other side as a gesture of gratitude for those things we have received from our cousins across the Atlantic, which we can never fully repay in kind.